thought we'd take the chance to do something about preaching in a pandemic because we've never done this session in any format before in previous years. It just didn't seem particularly relevant, but the actual preaching part, I, we don't want to take a lot of time, but we do want to just throw this at you because you may still be in a situation where you're preaching to camera instead of preaching to um, people in normal sense. So eight quick thoughts. All right, I'm not going to develop them much at all. Number one, don't be intimidated by bigger budgets. Okay, there are churches out there that have much better equipment and have very professional looking microphones and have a staff of people that can edit and prepare. And I, I saw within a week pictures on Facebook of people say, well, this is our setup for, you know, church in, a, in the pandemic. I was instantly intimidated by them because my setup was this. <laughs> I had a phone. That's all we all we had. But we were able to, to preach and get that out to church using just a phone. So don't be intimidated by people that have ridiculous budgets or amazing equipment. Okay. Number two, eye contact. Uh, when you're preaching, you learn to kind of look around and see different people and engage with them, hopefully, instead of staring at your notes. The hardest thing, I think, maybe one of the hardest things, is to get used to looking at one thing. All right. And so for me, especially here, because I've got faces, I was struggling with this yesterday. Mike Reeves was down here. He's asking me questions. I knew I had to look up here, but I was drawn to him. But you've kind of got to learn to, to look at the camera. And uh, that's eye contact. Every time you move away, it's not eye contact. And if you're speaking into a phone and you have it towards you, then you can see yourself and your eyes will be drawn to your face uh, for good or bad reasons. You'll, you'll be looking at yourself, which then looks like this when people are watching you. It looks like you're looking off to the side because you are. So it just takes a little bit of work. That's a new skill. And uh, maybe when we go back to being in church, we're going to have a camera and we're still going to have people at home. We're going to have to learn to look at a camera to engage people that aren't in the room, older generation or whatever. Number three, preach one to one, not to a group. I've seen some churches trying to replicate the church experience with the pastor in the pulpit making declarations as if there's people in the room. A, it looks weird because there's no people in the room and everybody knows that. And B, you're not in the room if you're listening. And so actually, even though I use the example of the Hebrews series, I knew I was speaking to hundreds of people, but I was communicating with gestures and with eye contact as if there's one person there. And that, that makes it more intimate because even though there's lots of people, you're coming through a screen directly to the people that are right there uh, on the other side of it. So everything shrinks. You don't have the great big gestures and the great big movement and all of that stuff. It, it kind of comes into this zone. Number four, preach to your church, not to the masses. All right, so if you're preaching to your church and there's 40 people in your church, be relevant to them. Don't worry about the potential of this sermon going viral. A, it won't go viral because everybody else is doing it and there's probably better preachers than all of us, uh, like Francis Chan or whoever, you know, master communicators. We're not going to beat them at their job so do your job, which is to care for your people. If someone on the other side of the planet listens in and benefits, praise the Lord. But your, your job is not to pastor somebody on the other side of the planet. So preach to your church. Be personal, personal to yourself and personal to the church. But be careful because it is online. So don't start telling stories about people in your church. Because even though you're thinking of the 40 people in your church, that person may not appreciate their relative hearing a reference to them doing such and such <laughs> you see what i mean so just recognize that once it's online it's gone you can't pull it back and fix it uh, six expect to be drained some of you some of us are drained every time we preach some of us are energized by preaching but preaching to a camera is not energizing in the same way as preaching to real people in in person and so I found myself feeling a whole lot more tired after focusing on that little dot and trying to communicate with energy when there's nothing coming back in the opposite direction. Uh, which is my point number seven, zero feedback during the message. Like no laughter, no, uh, no nodding, no agreeing, no 
um, no sense of whether people are tracking with you or not. And if you're not careful, you can become really dull because there's no energy and you can, you can end up quite formal or, or over explaining because nobody's there to give you your nod that says, yeah, I get what you're saying. And some preachers don't realize that without that nod, they can't actually progress. So you can kind of end up getting stuck and circling and repeating yourself. So zero feedback really is um, part of the mix that we need to sadly get used to for now. And then pray, which is kind of obvious, isn't it? But uh, pray about it. Pray about the technology. Pray about how it's going to come across. Pray that people can get on uh, at the right time or find the links or whatever. But also pray as if you're preaching in person that this will transform lives because technology doesn't do it your preaching doesn't do it god is the one who does that okay so there you go quick thoughts about preaching in a pandemic yeah so as well as considering preaching in a pandemic uh, we also want to consider what what it means to be a preacher in a pandemic so not just what we do but also who we are and uh, a friend of mine here uh, in rome compared this period of the pandemic to what takes place in scripture in the desert. And I found that comparison to be really, really helpful. Uh, deserts are places which are uncomfortable. Uh, there's distress, they tend to be longer than what you, you would like. There is uncertainty, you tend to spend time alone. Uh, but deserts in scripture are also places where there is heart searching. Uh, places where God forges characters and leaders. And so looking from this point of view of, of this time of, of the pandemic as a desert, let me just highlight four things, four lessons that I think are helpful or four areas that I think we should invest in uh, during this time. Well, when we think about what takes place in a desert in scripture, perhaps the first thing that comes to mind is the experience of Jesus in the desert in Matthew 4 and also in Luke uh, 4, where Jesus is fighting temptation or Jesus fought temptation. Uh, we also think to the time that the people of Israel spent in the desert for 40 years, uh, where they failed the time and time again. And I think if we want to uh, invest in ourselves as preachers and look after ourselves as preachers uh, during this time of the pandemic, I think we need to prioritize fighting temptation. And I think we need to fight both new temptations that are peculiar of this particular time that we're living in, but also use this opportunity uh, to fight those lifelong temptations that we seem to have, uh, you know, the typical ones that we struggle with as preachers. Uh, popularity, pride, uh, purity, peer pressure, uh, all of these P's, I uh, probably could list many uh, temptations with each letter of the alphabet, but these are some of the temptations that we face as preachers. And I think it would be helpful for us to use this time where by the grace of God and by the enabling of the Spirit of God, that we could get a decisive victory over some of these sins and temptations that we face uh, continuously. The second area I think that we should invest in and what takes place in the desert, again, thinking of Jesus, is we should major in prayer and fasting. And during this time of the pandem pandemic, depending on what uh, is taking place in your own country, there are some parts and some aspects of ministry that we're not able to do. But there are other aspects of ministry that we are able to do and despite that we don't do them and I think uh, we have very little excuse these days that we're limited in how, how much we can leave our homes not to major in prayer and in fasting. I know that for some of us ministry has perhaps become in a bizarre way even busier during this time but make sure we make this a priority. Um, when we think about preaching, I'm all for refining our techniques, uh, thinking about the art of homiletics and um, the word of God deserves our best communication. But I think the biggest problem in preaching today is the shallowness of preaching. 
And I think that comes from the lack of time that we spend in prayer and in fasting. So let's put this back in the center of, of our ministry. The third um, area that we should invest in is preparation. When you think of deserts in scripture, those were moments when the Lord was forging characters and forging leaders for what he had for them in the future. I think, for example, of the 40 years that Moses spent in the desert as a shepherd before then being a shepherd of God's people, the Lord was preparing him for future ministry. Or I'm thinking as well about those mysterious years of Paul that are mentioned in Galatians, uh, where after Damascus, he escapes apparently to Arabia, or he's in Arabia for two or three years, where he's being equipped for ministry. And uh, I think in this time of pandemic, it would be helpful for us to continue to invest in preparation, especially helping us being able to tackle the big questions. One of the things that the pandemic has caused is that it reminds us of the reality of suffering, the reality of life and death. And uh, we need to be able to tackle these questions. We may not have all the answers, we may not be able to write a book on coronavirus in a week, like uh, John Lennox or, or John Piper, uh, but we do need to be able to offer some answers to our people. So let's use this time of the pandemic to really invest in preparation. And the final thing I would say is that being in the desert or being in a pandemic, it's a good place to do some heart searching. Silence makes it easier to listen. Now think about Moses and his experience of the burning bush again in the desert. Or think even of the people of Israel who woke up every morning to see if the cloud had lifted from the tabernacle or if they should stay, if they should continue the journey. And sometimes the cloud stayed in the same place for one, two days, a week, a month. On other occasions it moved, moved on. And perhaps for us as preachers and pastors, it's a good time to really consider um, our ministry, consider what we're doing, and make sure we're still listening to what the Lord is calling us to do. And I think the pandemic has reminded us of how futile things like football and many of the other things that usually take so much attention are, and how much more important it is to invest in eternal matters. So let's make sure we're not just stuck in the ministry because that's our comfort zone or because it's easier. Let's use this time to listen to what God is saying to us. So fight temptation, pray, invest in preparation, and listen carefully to what the Lord is saying to you. Pastoring in a pandemic, the third of our topics, I was trying to refresh myself on the whole imagery of shepherding. Uh, looked on a website, uh, a guy who said 10 lessons he'd learned from shepherding. It wasn't a Christian article, it was just a guy who was literally a shepherd and he offered some, some really helpful thoughts that I thought had some bearing uh, on this. Um, for example, tend to the flock but care for the individual. I thought that was, a, that was a great thought. And it was going really well until the 10th point, um, which was this one. Nothing makes a party like a whole lamb on a spit. Um, now, uh, obviously I agree with him from a, from a physical point of view, but uh, actually from a spiritual point of view, there's, there's a sober, sobering point there. Ezekiel 34 uh, paints a picture of some evil shepherds, uh, shepherds that devoured the sheep and didn't feed them, who didn't bind up their wounds, who uh, didn't bring them back when they were going astray and didn't seek for lost sheep to bring into the fold. And so there is such a thing as a, a bad shepherd. Um, but at that same chapter, we have a, an amazing example of the great shepherd, the good shepherd, of course, our Lord God, who says, I, I myself will search out and seek for the lost sheep. He's the one that knows the best location grounds for them. He will personally bring them into a place of rest. He would judge between them, bring justice between the sheep and the sheep. And ultimately, he will set up his, his prince over them. And that obviously foretells that time when Jesus would come as the good shepherd who 
would give his life for the sheep. And so that, that's kind of like the starting point, really. We have a great shepherd already over the, the sheepfold. Um, and therefore, that makes us what we have perhaps called before um, under shepherds. I, I prefer the term sheep shepherd. Uh, I don't know if that's just what came into my head or whether I've heard it before reading it. But um, it sounds a bit weird. But I, I like the idea of being a sheep shepherd, not so much an under shepherd. The, the under shepherd perhaps implies in my mind that I'm not really a sheep, but I'm a, I'm a sheep shepherd, a, one that has been called from the flock. To, to shepherd the flock under the chief shepherd. So with that in mind, just a, a couple of thoughts. Firstly, let's think of some hindrances to pastoring in the pandemic. Again, I don't think these are gonna be new thoughts, but um, a lack of personal contact can feel lifeless, particularly in preaching, uh, picking up on what um, Peter was saying, uh, just not being able to see your congregation and minister to them through your own body language. Uh, when you're preaching, you know that some people are going through certain things and sometimes your, your gaze might look over lovingly in their direction. You can't do that on camera. So that's a hindrance. Wayward sheep may be harder to spot. And by the way, uh, wayward sheep aren't the ones that aren't coming to church. Wayward sheep can absolutely be the ones who are right in front of you each week. Uh, the, the Pharisee sheep, perhaps. But it's harder to spot them when you don't see them regularly, perhaps weary of shouting across the field. I'm thinking of the analogy of, of shouting across a field being things like Zoom. My family tell me I shout over Zoom all the time. Uh, maybe uh, you have the same challenge. Uh, they say there is a volume button the other person can turn down, but it just feels sometimes like Zoom isn't, you know, the best way, but it's what we've got at the moment. Um, wounds are harder to bind from a distance. Uh, two or three weeks ago, one of the, the brothers in our church said his cousin had passed away from COVID-19 and I wanted to go and sit with him and put my arm around him and pray with him and that was just it was just hard to have that conversation um, and I would suggest wolves abound often on the internet and I don't think there might be any more wolves around but it might be that that's more likely people might be diving into false teaching uh, with more time perhaps on the hand or they're looking for spiritual content and so that can make our job a bit harder so, so I'm not going to address each of those individually they're just some thoughts I know you feel free in the in the time in a moment to um to add some more to those if there are um i'm hoping this list will grow um but let's just think of some encouragements firstly uh, let the chief shepherd pass to you I, I love what peter emphasized this week from hebrew hebrews he prays for you he prays for you and i love the way that peter labored the point he prays for you and gave us a load of different scenarios he prays for you so let's remind ourselves of that picking up on what andy's just shared as well about our own life. Let our own life be close to the shepherd uh, as we pastor. Trust him for areas of the field that are unreachable. Sometimes it feels like we're kind of blowing a horn and we're hoping that the, the sheep are listening. Um, and I just say, trust trust God for the areas of the, the field that are unreachable. Something again that, that Peter shared yesterday in the interview, um, just about how um, our, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember how he worded it. Um, but we're not able to control the heart. Um, we can only offer the truth that's in, in the gospel. Um, so trust God for, the, for him to reach, because that's always been true. Thirdly, pastor, sorry, partner with other sheep shepherds. I'm sure you're doing this already, but interact with others, the resources that they're doing. You don't have to be them or duplicate what they're doing, but we can learn from each other. Fourthly, continue to develop a pastoral care team. I think this has been really key for us. Um, you're not the one that's responsible for people's souls, ultimately God is, but um, you can develop a pastoral care team where the, the work is offloaded. And that really connects with the next one as well. Consider how to grow, grow new disciple makers. So for example, during this pandemic, are there, are there some signs of, of uh, people leaning in and actually wanting to, to grow and wanting to minister to others that they might be where your new leaders are coming from? So look at how you can do that in church. Um, avoid comparing with a flock in the next field. I think again Peter alluded to it earlier. Um, uh, just as an example for us in Cornerstone, so Steve Mitchell on, on the group here is at Cornerstone, our sister church, um, and they've been doing live streams. We've been doing pre-recorded um, and it would be easy to compare and think, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not able to do that, but actually I've had this real peace in saying that's right for them. Pre-recorded services are right for us at the moment. Um, and we can learn from each other. And then finally, keep shepherding the flock as individuals in a world of statistics. I've just been 
uh, constantly looking at BBC to, to watch the numbers coming down. I'm sure we all have. We're, we're longing for the numbers to fall. But in the midst of all of that, people are individuals. So let's just ask for God's help to keep seeing them as individuals and minister to them in the way he's called us.